there is some outstanding school provisions and there's some inadequate ones and there's some outstanding PVI providers and there's some inadequate ones. So I think um, a lot of what our sector is, is people, but with people, you've got to have a good program and product as well. I sense that the strange world we're in at the moment is we work with schools that are currently running their own provision and are asking us to take it on uh, because it's grown it's either grown or they're they're struggling to make it sustainable and therefore the chupy transfer of staff is challenging and the admitted body status of high pensions and so on which again we'll take on so you've got that side of it which is currently happening Um, you've then got the side of we're running as a pvi partner and the school are saying to us oh we think we could do this and then we want to work with them. You know, and we've had some really successful handovers to schools operating. But we've also had schools then realise, ah, you know what? Actually, we didn't know what you were doing underneath it. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Drive Phase podcast from Coordinate Sports. This is your show about sports founders, leaders and experts and the stories behind their business journeys. On today's episode, we have another panel discussion. Uh, we just wrapped a really engaging discussion around the newly announced childcare wraparound funding uh, in the UK. Uh, this funding provides local authorities with a share of over £289 million to invest in childcare settings in their local area. Uh, joining me on the conversation was Craig Jones, the Chief Child Experience Officer for the Junior Adventures Group, who are one of the largest providers in the UK and globally, catering for around 20,000 children each week Um, and also Craig is part of the DFE's steering group that's worked really hard uh, lobbying for this funding Uh, so it's great to have his insights today. Uh, Also joining us was uh, Rob Brown, the Managing Director of First Step Sports Group, another um, leading active care provider as well as uh, workforce development and training provider. Um, So Rob was um, providing his insight into into what it's going to actually take for providers um, to gear up in the sector to be able to meet demand, uh, which is sure to be coming down the line in in September. Uh, And also Andrew Hicks, our new UK Managing Director joined us uh, just to talk about how um, Coordinate Sport as a SaaS provider, software provider, um, are gearing up or tailoring our offering to make sure that we can provide local authorities, schools and activity providers with with kind of the the back office support and systems that they require to be able to deliver a great service uh, and meet the requirements of the funding as well as uh, the demand for for wraparound childcare that exists already. Um, Yeah, great conversation, um, good fun to to, to meet up with everyone and and have a discussion around where we see things are and where we see they're going. Uh, If you are, like I said, local authorities, school, active, uh, activity provider. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to hear a bit, hear a little bit more, um, as well as the other content we'll be bringing you on the subject, uh, including guides and, and other webinars. So, yeah, great to kick kick things off. So, enjoy the show. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Drive Face Podcast. Um, delighted today to have another panel discussion with some some really great guests, um, knowledgeable in this in our sector, but specifically um, talking today around wraparound childcare and the state of the industry and what's to come in the future. Um, Joining me today is Craig Jones, the Chief Child Experience Officer for Junior Adventures Group, the UK's largest um, provider of wraparound care. Andrew Hicks, the UK Managing Director of Coordinate Sport and colleague of mine. And Rob Brown, the Managing Director of the First Step Sports Group, um, leading provider in active care training and development. So thanks for joining me, guys. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us on, James. Looking forward to it. Yeah, we obviously had a long, long preamble before we started, so um, nice and nice and warmed up. So I think we're going to dive dive straight in. I'm going to go to you, Craig, just to before we get into the discussion about where things are going and where they're heading and and kind of the opportunities and the um, and the funding, everything that's that's um, just about to to um, be implemented. It'd be great to kind of see maybe if we go back just a few years, like current current situation around um, childcare, wraparound childcare specifically, um, and, and kind of where, how we got to this point. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for your time tonight, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the National Wraparound Childcare Fund is, is definitely sort of two years in the making, if you like. Um, so there's no doubt that we, we're, we're all probably aware that the early years area has been widely funded and, you know, people may have views on if that's adequate or not in relation to nursery entitlement. But something for school age childcare and um, that's been very seen very little funding um, in previous years and, and forever really um, so 
this is great news for the sector without a doubt that they've got some uh, some money coming into it and now it's a, a case of dissecting that and understanding maybe how that how that works and and who can access it and so on um there's no doubt that you know wrap around child care is is sort of delivered by three three kind of um I guess stakeholders, if you like. The first one is the school. Um, so lots of schools run their own provision, um, and clearly that's something that some schools find that easy, some schools find that challenging. Um, depends how uh, large the club is, um, how much admin they can take on. Um, it depends if they they can find the workforce or they can extend the teaching assistance hours and so on. Um, then there's something called PVI providers, which is the private, voluntary, or independent providers, and that is something that junior ventures group are um so we fit into that that section as a, as i think rob does as well um and then there might be something like a child minder or a cluster approach whereby there might be a walking bus to a local community venue so it's not even housed in the school for example um, and again some pvi providers might run that and that's been the traditional models for a while now um and the department of education have carried out some data that suggests that 50% of schools don't offer a full wraparound service. And that's probably important to, to state that that doesn't mean that they're not running an after school or a breakfast club, but is it running from um, eight till six or 7.45 till six? And that's sort of classed as the full wraparound. We know that lots of schools have got after school clubs or enrichment clubs and so on. Um, other schools might have a breakfast club, but no wraparound facility at the end of the day. Um, and that data now is being is, is sort of local authorities are then working through that data at the moment to find out the supply and demand. So, yeah, no doubt the sector's changed a lot, um, but it, it's sort of it's a highly competitive area without a doubt. Um, but clearly the the requirement is to be Ofsted registered and obviously to access those tax free childcare childcare vouchers to make it more affordable for parents. Does that give an overview? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Great. I mean, just looking at the volume as well, I think in scale and volume, just in terms of, um, in terms of Jag, your footprint. Um, and I guess the, the, the typical demographic or the, the school that you're working in, um, I, as a private provider, you, I'm assuming you're going to have to focus on where's the most viable. So that would be the larger schools. Is that correct? Or yeah, it'd be good to have a, yeah, it is. I mean, uh, basically, we, yeah, we work with over 200 schools at the moment um, in a wraparound function. And, and that sounds big, but it's tiny. You know, we've got 17,000 primary schools in the UK. So us being the largest isn't isn't that big. Um, it just means that we are attempting to scale something that's quite difficult to scale, ultimately. Um, and and we're trying to take a local approach as opposed to a global approach, because that, that definitely seems to work um, better, as I'm sure um rob's got case studies like that as well knowing the local area and, and building that community um we're i guess we're quite lucky that we've got um we're part of a wider group as well so we we do the junior ventures group also deliver wraparound in australia new zealand ireland and the uk um so we're able to learn off each other and it, i guess it's important to note that the uk is the only market where that isn't subsidized by government um so the other markets is and therefore you can tell that Again, how to make that affordable is really hard. So you're right, James, you know, in, in a one form entry school, that is challenging. Um, is the demand there? Um, normally we sort of see a sort of 10%, 20% um, percentage of school role that might be, not might need wraparound. But, but needing it and actually being able to afford it are two different things. And I think it's important that there's lots of parents that are maybe choosing not to use wraparound because they can't afford it. However, they do want to, they do need it and need to go back to work or need that extended day for them as well. So it's how we can make it affordable, and accessible. And, the, and we've got quite a range in footprint from one form entry to three form entry schools. There's no doubt there's greater demand generally in larger schools, but also the free school meal percentage and um, the kind of demographic. Is it commuterville, you know, or is it is it a case of uh, it's rural and therefore people aren't working, um, don't need it so much and maybe have local roles. So yeah, we, we're, the demographic is very different, but I think we'll touch on this fund. It gives an opportunity to grow wraparound and to sort of have, um, I don't know if this is the technical term, but like a leg up <laughs> to make it sustainable. So you can start it and then build the demand as you go, as opposed to needing to get 15 to 20 children straight away, which again, 
needs to build because children need to understand it's a good experience and they get benefits from it and the families benefit from it as well. Definitely going to um, circle back and really dive into the funding, but you mentioned there about scaling and the challenges. Um, just like you said, you're a large provider, but just really scratching the surface uh, in terms of the, the actual demand is. Rob, I'm going to throw it to you in terms of like looking at looking at some of those challenges to scale. I know specifically speaking to the private providers or the, the sports coaching, typical sports coaching um, providers that we all kind of work with day in, day out. Those challenges around scaling, generally you'd be working with the workforce, um, but what, have you, what are you seeing and especially with the, what is going to be a, a kind of an incoming huge demand where like how far away are we and what the what the kind of the the workforce development requirements are yeah well i think first thing to consider really is is although the the funding is really welcomed by everyone in the industry i would i would assume um it's important to know that it's not going to come without its challenges um obviously sustainability is a word that gets thrown around a lot and, and craig will know better than me but providing the funding to providers to provide childcare but not be able to have, like amend the cost of childcare is always going to be difficult. Um, I think the approaches that councils take as well, we've had a number of discussions with our local councils recently and they seem to be of the opinion where that they're doing all their surveys currently to see what the demand is for childcare. But actually really I think part of from what I understood the government announcement to be is that we should be looking to oversubscribe or over provide childcare to then convince parents that using childcare is a viable option for them so that it can work. Because I think a lot of parents right now are in a position where they have the option to work from home, where it's not ideal having children around while you work from home, but as opposed to a cost of childcare which can be considerable if you're doing three and four hours a day, um it, it sometimes might be the option. Um, so I think that's one thing that we kind of need to, is, is a huge challenge. So you're for saying to, it's almost been disregarded then by some parents just think, oh, that's not viable. Um, so we'll just make other arrangements. It's more of like a behaviour change thing for people that it could be up an opportunity for them. Exactly that change. I think that's probably another challenge, like changing the narrative around what childcare and wraparound care actually is. I mean, from a parent's perspective, I know myself, like it comes with an element of guilt sometimes if, if you have to put a child into childcare after school, maybe just because they don't have the understanding that wraparound childcare can be fun and engaging and, and educational and help with um, homework, etc. and be really beneficial socially for children. Um, and often it, like parents can have that feeling of guilt or oh, I'm just sending them to, to wrap around care after school care so that I can work. It kind of feels a little bit selfish. But really, if we can demonstrate to those parents and provide the wrap around care um, and get children in and show that they can really enjoy their time at wrap around care um, and have a great experience, that it, it kind of changes that whole narr- narr- uh, narrative around wrap around care moving forward. Nice. And I know in terms of um, scaling, well, we're, we're working with providers. Um, Andy, I know you'll have, you'll have had a plenty of conversations. I know you've been ongoing conversations with our, um, our partners around obviously where we sit in, in terms of systems and, um, and operations and kind of trying to streamline that. Um, it could be that if, um, I guess you'll be able to elaborate more, but that if there's not a robust system in place, it could just, it could be, be an additional admin nightmare, if you know what I mean, to, to be able to manage this? Yeah, well, I th- look, I think we've already heard that it's a complex thing, right? I think the, you know, whether whether it's access to the funding or then getting towards delivery, it's not easy. Um, our job at Coordinate is to try and make the delivery part as easy as possible. Um, we were very quick to adapt our platform for the half reporting, for the free school meal reporting, which is usually successful, which is something that everyone needed. There, when when activity providers were given funding, they had to report on that funding in a particular way, and we incorporated that into a platform, and that's currently what we're looking at. Uh, also, sort of PDF printable invoices as well. Um, so, look, we're trying to get on as quickly as possible to make the whole thing as, as seamless as, as, as we possibly can. We talked about those people who are, um, it feels like we've spoken about people who are just working at the moment, obviously. Those those are in receipt of obviously childcare benefit and um, there are some challenges around or maybe some additional administration, like you said there, um, Dixie. When we're looking at uh, 
it's one for you really, Craig, in terms of like that that compliance and if a provider or if there's going to be new entrants to the market, which I'm sure there will be the, the current provide the current um operators need to be able to scale up and, and um enhance their offer, but also the new entrants to the market, there's gonna be a lot of I guess a lot of people needing some support in terms of Ofsted registration and other things that they maybe haven't gone through before. Yeah, definitely. There's, I mean, we've worked with the with the um, DFE and the civil servants in, in trying to put a checklist together for PVI providers so they can really make it really clear, um, you know, what you need and what the what you should be ready for in relation to um, being a PVI provider for wraparound. And clearly being Ofsted registered is one because part of this fund is making it accessible and affordable for parents and as Rob said, that is a, that is a challenge, and therefore being off the register at least it opens the door to universal credit, to tax free childcare, and and to vouchers, and can help with with payments for parents. So that's one of the requirements. Yeah, having robust terms and conditions, um, having partnership agreements with sport with schools. So therefore, there is a real clear understanding of you know. And, and I would really go with you know if any local authority or schools are listening, then PVI are absolutely in partnership with you. They are not just a lisa of space you know they are absolutely working together we've got we're looking after the children in the school so and we've got some really strong partnerships um that you can really benefit and see the benefit from in the enrichment side of it and supporting send children which is i'm sure we'll get onto which is a huge area of, of need and development um so yeah and, and that checklist also includes obviously clearly as levels of insurance should should you have a website well yes should you have a booking system absolutely because you need to be able to accept subsidies therefore again the complexities of that should be within within the built within the system um and then ultimately should you have maybe a track record of having inspections and food hygiene being a food registered organization which again is important if you're supplying food um which again generally you will be in wraparound nine times out of ten um, so there's there's a clear we we've tried to support with a sample checklist and again um, you know for local authorities that that's really important so that they don't what what I sense was with HAF which is again you know great initiative however we've got 153 different ways of doing it in each local authority um, and different checklists and so on well let's try and standardise that let's try and help each other um, in understanding what the mandatory requirements are and then also what are the nice to haves. Um, and what kind of experience is that? And you know, Rob touched on it. Workforce, what's your robust plan if there is absence? Um, how are you going to report on the safe plan? And how are you going to support send children? All challenging areas, but as a provider, it's obviously a requirement of ours. Um, and again, I don't know if we'll get into it, but it is slightly strange that as a PVI provider, we have clear standards we need to be, yet if a school operates an out of school and wraparound, they don't have the same guidance which again is fine that's not me who writes the rules but it does feel a bit a bit strange yeah I definitely want to talk just while we're, while we're on there is there a qualification requirement so if we're looking at the um the delivery team um for, for a wraparound provision obviously the food hygiene etc but in terms of a, an actual delivery qualification and we've got our minimum standards across the board for you know PE and school sport but is there if there isn't is there something that we should point towards is it is it those minimum standards don't know, Rob, if you want to jump on that one, that would be a good place for you. I think what's important to note is obviously there are obviously qualifications that you need to have from a, a compliance perspective, like you mentioned before, safe gone, DBS checked, first aid trained, food hygiene if you've got a food offering, uh, some kind of health and safety training or awareness. Um, but in terms of the minimum operating standards for your delivery on on wraparound care, it's actually left wide open, which which to some people would seem a little bit concerned. I guess it's because lots of wraparound care providers um, come from a different angle. So you might have a wraparound care provider who has a focus around sport and physical activity or arts and crafts or uh, music or whatever the provision might be. So it's important that you have um, some staff that are trained um, appropriately for delivery and have experience in delivery, um, somewhere around any kind of level two certificate in your your industry is advised strongly. So, for example, a level two motor skills or coaching qualification for the sports providers, uh, level two childcare, I guess, lends itself really nicely. Um, there are apprenticeship models and employment models for apprenticeships that, that lend themselves quite nicely to wraparound care for private organisations as well, stuff like community activator or uh, early years practitioner, if, depending whether or not you've got early years children or accessing uh, provision. 
um, level four sports coach, even the level three teaching assistant apprenticeship standard. They're all standards that, that will provide you with the knowledge, the skills, and behaviors that will really benefit uh, the children in that brown care and the staff that are providing it. But and, and Craig's touched on it a couple of times the importance of catering and being inclusive and catering for people with with um, SEN. So having staff that have got knowledge or training in, in special education and needs, but in terms of like a, a formal qualification or a, a tick spot. There there isn't really one, which I guess is is something that is important to note, and especially from insurance perspectives for private providers, like a lot of us will make our own decisions on what we deem the right qualification, the right skills, the right knowledge to have to be able to deliver within the standard that you set for your own provision. But just thinking about, and you mentioned there, Craig, about kind of schools operating and then the PVI. What are the, I know there's going to be so many different models of delivery, but in terms of um, the difference, I'm guessing that in terms of moving quickly to meet the demand, it's probably going to be the majority of it's going to be delivered by schools. I might be, I might be wrong there. Let me know. Um, we just felt like that in terms of the numbers you're talking about. Um, what are those different models? And I guess looking at it from just outside in, it, it feels like a PVI may be able to provide more of an enhanced offer just because, just because of their specific skill set, but that could be, I guess, could be uh, could be wrong, so it'd be good to hear from. I know that your approach has has always been active and and um, an active childcare offer, but yeah, it'd be good to hear hear the different models. Yeah, well, where do I start, James? Love the question. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, ultimately, there is some outstanding school provisions, and there's some inadequate ones, and there's some outstanding PVI providers, and there's some inadequate ones. So, I think um, a lot of what our sector is is people um but with people you've got to have a good program and product as well um so i i sense that i mean the the strange world we're in at the moment is we work with schools that are currently running their own provision and are asking us to take it on uh, because it's grown it's either grown or they're they're struggling to make it sustainable and therefore the chupy transfer of staff is challenging and the admitted body status of high pensions and so on which again we'll take on so you've got that side of it, which is currently happening. Um, you've then got the side of we're running as a PVI partner and the school are saying to us, oh, we think we could do this. Um, and then we want to work with them. You know, and we've had some really successful handovers to schools operating. But we've also had schools then realize, ah, oh, you know what? Actually, we didn't know what you were doing underneath it. You know, the fact that. Yes, we have got, and again, bookings clearly are in uh, administration is a clear area of um, high maintenance. The the fact that of taking subsidies is is a challenging thing, and anyone that takes childcare vouchers and the reconciliation then will know it's not the easiest um, with about four thousand different voucher options. Um, then you've got the uh, universal credit applications, even student finance, tax free childcare. While that sounds relatively easy, that it it's the level of expertise that, again, customer service teams would have. And then absolutely the program. I, I think wraparound care can be an extension of the school day. But but also, at the end of the day, it's different. You know, in, I've got a year four class of all the same children, aged children. In wraparound, I've got a four-year-old and an 11-year-old. That's a different skill set. You know, how do we engage them all together? How do we make sure we give them responsibility? And um, it's a bit geeky, but research would tell us that children that attend after school programs and wraparound care are more social which isn't a surprise if i'm honest and you'll see it in the playground and i love to see that and the children will build relationships with each other and they'll be like how do you know someone in year five you'll be like oh well they go to the after school club with me and that's a cool thing they're all of a sudden understanding how to communicate with each other different ages siblings working together and so on and of course that that can be challenging as well having those different range of abilities and so on but You'll find that real high quality provision is a case of saying, well, actually, you can see it and feel it when you walk in, you know, the atmosphere, how respectful the children are. Um, and that's really important. And, and the enrichment side, I think, you know, I'm sure Rob's got the same. Our program is pretty extensive. You know, we call it our adventure program. And the fact we've got children carrying out children's meetings weekly, we've got weekly planners in, in place. It's, it's, a, it's a skill. It's not a will rock up and put some board games out and there you go and and you know i've i don't know if it's a privileged position but i've met with a fair few ministers and you know spoken to labor about their breakfast club um future sort of manifesto which sounds really great free breakfast clubs everywhere 
Um, but what is that? Is that 100 children in a school hall waiting for a bagel? I don't know. If it is, I'm not totally sure that's what we really need. Um, we want some great quality activities to engage people. And that's hard. Don't get me wrong. It's hard to retain people. It's hard to develop them. But yeah, I feel like I'm on my soapbox. But ultimately, yes, we, we've got everything from working with schools to bring provision back to PI, PVI providers. We've got schools asking for more revenue from us, um, which is understandable because the schools are under pressure um, financially. Um, but ultimately, it's the parent that is going to have to pay. And therefore, while this fund is fantastic, we're big advocates of actually reform and having some universal funding model for parents as opposed to for providers or for local authorities. And don't get me wrong, this is great that money's coming into the sector. But again, how we use it to Rob's point and make it sustainable is going to be really important. Yeah, and that, that school's been under pressure, obviously, to run in theme, well, it has been running theme last decade or maybe longer than that but Rob I know in terms of the way you run your programme I know it's different in different schools but that opportunity for um, schools to make revenue obviously from the higher facilities but also the savings around their the, the spend on after school programming as well I don't know if you want to touch on that in terms of how you, how you operate things there. Yeah exactly that and I guess that's one of the benefits of, of using a, a private uh, provided to come in and do wraparound care. To, Craig mentioned some of the benefits before and what some of the, the headaches really that come with wraparound care for schools uh, with regards to administration tasks, booking systems, uh, resources, that kind of stuff. So to be able to, I guess, offload that onto a private provider that you can trust to, to provide quality childcare is great. And then obviously the income for facility hire, if if the program is sustainable and, and making enough revenue is always going to be an added bonus for, for schools. And then being able to, um, I guess, just facilitate the offset inspection rather than be, be a, a focused offset inspection on, on the school is, is a positive as well for them. So there's like loads of benefits to be able to use a, a private provider. And Craig mentioned before, like it, it's not just a case of rocking up with a few board games. We've got some specific skills, um, in the private providers that, that schools who are just using teaching assistants or um, teachers who, who might not necessarily always want to be there um, can't, like, can't provide. So I guess, um, yeah, there's, there's tons of bonuses to use in a private provider in that respect. Andy, I know we're working hard on the reporting aspect as well. Um, Craig, you're working on a few partnerships at the moment, Andy, where Craig mentioned those childcare vouchers, the kind of dreaded... Uh, reconciliation of, of all the all of the different different funders so it might be good to if you want to touch on that what we're doing from a coordinate perspective yeah look I think um, we, we've I've already touched on it is that our our whole mission the whole reason why coordinate exists and the whole reason we were founded was to to make the participation in in any sort of activity easier and and we've already we've already heard even before we get anywhere near a sports hall it's it's complex right um, and I think we're very much of the opinion now that look, we we started off life as a, as a booking system. That's that's what we were. Uh, we are a hell of a lot more than that now. We we tend to be a one stop shop. However, there are certain aspects of certainly voucher payments that Craig's already touched on, where there are some specific providers in the market that do that, and we are looking at some some integration with those partners. To make the whole thing easier, we, I think, um, we're we're not going to try and be everything to everyone within our our little sphere of booking and administration. Then we are a lot of things to many people, but I think with the complexity around the, the voucher payments, we're we're certainly looking at some really really interesting partnerships that will just save a huge amount of time, a huge amount of administration and, and and get people back coaching, get people back engaging with the children rather than a, a whole load of administration work. James, I don't know if it helps, but, you know, we, and I, I don't know if Rob's had this, but we um, clearly wrap around care is also can be great for supporting vulnerable children um, that need extended care, that need that respite, that need the, the level of support and often we will reduce any revenue given to a school but actually provide free spaces for vulnerable children on a daily basis now that that is something that look it's something that should we do well yes it's the right thing to do 
But actually, again, if we had a sustainable model and it may be a universal reform, that, that would should exist for these young people as well. Um, which again, it, and, and we've got ideas, we've got solutions, um, again, to present to, to um, government and so on. But ultimately, you know, we, we know the value of wraparound care to help the labour market is great. To get people back to work is good, but people have got a decision to make. Can they afford it? Um, so this fund, again, making it affordable and accessible. And maybe to touch on Rob's point around demand, I don't know if Rob sees this, but we, you know, we do lots of, um, if we're going to go into a new school, we will do surveys and we will reach out to the parents. And very rarely do you get an exact science. It's obviously important what you ask. Um, lots of people tick yes for lots of things and then don't actually come. Um, and I fear that some of the supply and demand we're doing now is the tip of the iceberg. And actually, we found that you need to start and commit to wrap around. You need to become part of the school, part of consistency, and then you can grow it. You can't obviously price sensitive is, is important, um, but ultimately good quality will prevail as well. And that I think is something that this fund really gives an opportunity to schools and providers to, to invest at the start not have to risk or can I only put two members of staff on? No, we can have three. We can build that commitment. We can support the SEND children um, and therefore we can really provide that quality. So that that is, I see as the huge benefit and also some of the clubs whereby we've got excess demand. I see that this fund can support by again, helping with workforce development, pathways for team members and so on. Yeah, I mean that that conf I guess that confidence consistency is key, right? For parents, especially if it's a new provision, I've got to be sure that this is still going to be. If I leave my current setup or whatever it is, whether it's grandparents or someone else picking up or car sharing, whatever, if if the provision's not there next term, then it's it's going to be a challenge. So, I guess that's a good point to touch on the the actual the funding. Um, I guess exactly what it's there for, how it's going to be deployed, what what the um, kind of what the setup is and what it covers and what it doesn't. Because I know Craig you mentioned there on that additional support, um, which for you as a as a larger provider or in a larger school probably would be easier to absorb versus a small village school with maybe a small group of kids and, and one or two with with um, additional needs in there. That might be a lot more challenging. So yeah, I don't know who wants to who wants to jump on um, just to kind of touch on the the funding uh, aspects how it's come down. I know Rob, you've got been working with some of the local councils as well, so. Yeah, I don't mind starting, so if, if that's all right, and then Craig, you can jump in with anything you have missed or you need to add. But um, I guess essentially it's important to know that the funding is coming in for, for two years. The idea is the funding is going to be here from 2024 to 2026 to ensure that um, we can try to create a sustainable model and grow wrap around care in, in schools so that the parents are convinced to use it. Now, it's important to understand what the wraparound care is there to fund and what it's not there to fund so that we can kind of put together a plan of sustainability moving forwards. Because like I mentioned earlier, um, funding is not there to reduce the price of childcare costs for parents, unfortunately, which I feel like might be a bigger benefit right now. Um, funding is there to, or the programme funding as it is, is there to uh, kind of bridge the gap until you can convince parents that Wrap around care is a, a viable option, basically. So if you're working in a school where they are a relatively small school, one form entry, and they've only they've got a, a small wrap around care offer, it's often really difficult to find a sustainable model for delivery for that. So what they're saying is once you find the sustainable um price around that that wrap around care, um funding is there to kind of bridge that gap until you can convince enough parents that wrap around care is a, is a good option to use. Now, there is additional funding, capital funding, which can be used to um, buy asset, assets, basically, or invest in programs. So if you, you need to, and I guess this is probably for, for larger schools that maybe need to increase their around care offer because they, they haven't got enough capacity to, to offer enough places for the demand that's there, which I guess is probably a great place to start. But uh, if they need to, to buy a new facility, build a new wing on the school, or if they need to I buy a minibus to help the, the community cluster offer or, or something like that, then that is there as well to, to use. But essentially, the, the program funding itself is there to, to bridge the gap. Now, one concern I have with that is that a couple of the local councils that I've spoken to recently, although I am all for understanding the demand 
that is necessary for that round care in their area. They're coming off the approach where they're just asking whether parents need wraparound care and not whether or not they're going to use it long term. Um, so to explain a little bit more clearly, um, if from a parent's perspective, I receive a survey and I'm able to have my child at home while I'm working and I'm asked whether I need to wrap around care, there is a good chance I might just say no. And then they're not going to understand the actual true demand for the wraparound care. Whereas from what I understood from the government release, it is a good idea for local authorities and schools to try and over provide wraparound care so that we can convince parents to get back into work and that working is um, an option for them in the extended hours from from eight till six rather than just muddle by because they can muddle by because of the huge benefits for, for children and parents for wraparound care. One parents have, have got more access to work and more access to fund, I guess, that way, um, with the rising cost of everything and cost of living right now. And then for par- uh, for children, sorry, the the social element, the learning element, um, and all those benefits that the, the meal element that comes with, with wraparound care. I agree. I, I do sense that Local authorities obviously got um, they've got autonomy to see what they what their needs are in their local authority and what the um, local demand is and so on, which is good. But I, but I am slightly apprehensive about lots of different um, models, um, and and to try and keep it as simple as possible would 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 probably make sense. But yeah, the fund is there. With, with that, Craig, are you thinking like kind of the half thing where it's open for interpretation a little bit from each from each local authority? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, look, it, and I think um, even if you 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 know we a local authority's got to complete a delivery plan that delivery and they've got some templates and the the delivery partners childcare works and they're supporting that um, which again is is positive. But I think that if we can learn from anything, any kind of guidance is interpretation, and we can learn from COVID in regards to that respect, can't we? That we all read something and interpret it a different way, and actually to make anything scalable and sustainable sometimes it's the clearer the guidance the better and um you know the p it's great that the pbis are really clearly mentioned in the guidance i think that's fantastic um but the but how the funding can be sourced and applied for is still unsure are schools applying for it are pbi providers applying for it um some local authorities will take a different view and i i actually don't know bearing in mind we but we don't know um, Rob, I don't know if you've got any insight, but it doesn't. It's we're uncertain in some of the local authorities we're working with. Yeah, and if I'm honest, I, we're in the same boat in, in our local area as well. Councils are still a little bit unclear. Um, we have councils that are a little bit more advanced than others in their process. We have one council who have hired someone using capacity funding to manage the project, who's then gone on sick, and now the project isn't moving forwards, which is unfortunate, but really, really not helpful. Um, we've got one local council who is focusing on um, just providing to the need um, and haven't really released any information to schools on how, how funding is going to be accessed or, how, or who's going to access funding, like you mentioned before. Um, from what we're led to believe that it, it will be the school that has to um, apply for the funding and then distribute it as they see fit, um, which might suit a lot of models, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I, I have a similar concern that it, it's, it, it could be left to interpretation. One well, with the local authorities, everyone's going to have their own model, everyone's going to have their, their own way. Um, another local authority was a lot more forthcoming um, and they've released information around um, gaining capital funding but not yet program funding. So um, I guess we're in a position, one local council, where one of the, the primary schools that they were currently supporting is, is in desperate need because they had a private provider in previously who, who let them down because there was no sustainability in their model um, and they've been left and it's been dumped on staff who were having to help as volunteers so they've had to really cry for help to their local council um who are forthcoming and said that they might be able to support from summer term but i know the other councils that we've spoken to can't even consider providing funding from summer term and i know that wasn't the aim it was from september um but it was mentioned in in the release to local authorities that in some cases in, in special needs especially that um the, the funding might be available from from summer term, but yeah, I mean, the, most of the councils that we've spoken to are, are kind of no further forward, and I don't know whether that's a, a universal thing from, from what you're saying, Jen, uh, Greg, it sounds similar, but yeah, unfortunately, no real solid guidance on, on who's going to apply for the funding, how it can be applied for, and exactly when it's going to be available. So, yeah, it sounds like a difficult one for any, um, I guess, providers who wanting to, to get 
involved or to try and gear up for that. And I think that's probably why you might see PVIs or um, moving quicker because they know what it takes to to recruit and train and get the workforce together for for something that's going to eventually hit. But I know obviously for the it must be challenge definitely going to be challenging for the local authorities where um, they're going to be inundated. I'm sure with um, demand and and requests and maybe. It's, Whoever's whoever's the budget's been been passed to in the council's probably got another day job they're doing as well. So um, understand that that challenge like it was with half when that first was released. Um, if if we could look at I don't know whether we can or because it's a bit of a grey area right now. But any like real practical advice for anyone who's um, whether it's a school listening um, or or a PVI or or um, anyone else who's, who's a stakeholder, how would they go about? Um, I guess either gearing up or getting getting involved. What's the best place to go? Um, I know it's, I know you you're looking at um, content courses, webinars, things like that from our perspective at Coordinate. Um, but anything specific would be would be great to share. I think for, from our point of view, look, we're 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 more than happy to you know to try and help people point them in the right direction, whether they're a current client or a current customer of Coordinate or not. You know, I think um, look. We want it to be rolled out. We want people to use it. We want people to access it. If we, if we can help, look, we're we're more than happy to try and point uh, point in the right direction. Yeah. So I, get, I mean, in terms of getting your ducks in a row as a provider, um, Craig, what would you what would you be your first? I guess your first step for anyone who's looking at delivering from September. I guess or maybe even after that. Capacity building as much as possible, um, and that's people. I think um, you know the, there's no doubt that great provisions normally have great people attached to them um so how we look after those those great team members and the people that truly engage the children and instill that confidence and self-esteem and so on that's great um so certainly things around and rob touched on it but you know even apprenticeship opportunities whereby people are learning um and while there isn't a totally specific um framework i guess playwork is one um community activator is slightly another um depending on what you're you're delivering but yeah it's um i would say capacity building with people which is hard to invest in but that that certainly is is definitely our biggest challenge in our sector and you've seen that department of education have launched their launched their something big um do something big campaign which is their recruitment campaign around raising awareness of working with children and wraparound and childcare as well early years so that should help um but yeah i'd say that if you're not Ofsted registered, then you need to be. Um, but I'd also say that you. Uh, my gut feel is that it's not something you should go in lightly with. You don't. You shouldn't just go. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Um, it. It is. It's complex. You know, there, it relates to the relationships, the partnerships, um, the sustainability, the accepting bookings, whether that be instalment plans, full term bookings. Ad, ad hoc booking terms and conditions within that um and, I, and i'd say that you know build out a plan um but ultimately i think existing providers are probably well placed because they can mobilize quicker and i think to rob's point new provision in september and some potential support in the summer term we need to move quickly therefore existing provision and capacity building our people is is probably the best and i, I guess people people who are, who are already off stead registered maybe just for holiday provision that if this if it's something they've got capacity to move into they're probably better placed than others because they've they kind of know the offsted requirements to a certain extent obviously for holiday yeah they do yeah and then you know there there is some schools will want an early years area for their wraparound so they'll want the reception nursery children to be catered for so that is a different registration, um, and that's important to know as well. And there, and there is certainly tighter constraints around qualifications then as well. So, I mean, read up on it, um, and I, and I would say that they, to me, obviously schools operating themselves is is a good model, um, and, and PVI providers is a good model. And then in those really small or maybe rural schools, maybe a childminder is a is a great option as well because you know it might be a, a small number of children that require collection. And child minds could either look after those within school or within their home or community hub as well. So, or or looking at a cluster approach whereby some schools come together as a walking bus to help sustainability as well. Where do you think that it's kind of open question? Where do you think this funding fits in the in a wider scheme of things? So obviously, DfE have got a lot of different funding pots and things going on, um, and 
I don't know if it's if it, like imminent, but a change of government potentially coming in um, more than likely. With all the funding, especially specifically talking to the to kind of our niche and our um, our sector, whereby there's question marks around funding that's coming to an end or potentially coming to an end or has thought was coming to an end for years, like PE premium, uh, pupil premium, obviously half all those all those different funding pots. Do we feel like Craig? You're probably best place, obviously, um, being in Parliament so much that you, you'll not, maybe know, <laughs> maybe know if anyone wants to check out the BBC Parliament channel. Um, you might know, you might know um, what the direction of travel is a little bit, for, or maybe you don't. But it just it seems that a lot of providers might think that's where we should shift our focus. Whereas before, maybe you go 10, 10, 15 years back, it was PE premium, whatever. So it's kind of um, be good to get your insight on that one. Yeah, I mean it. No, this is while what I'm going to say now is a is a, a personal opinion and, a, and a, our company opinion. I do sense that there's quite a lot of backing, and we've started to speak with other PVI providers, and it seems like this is a sensible approach. But I think for too long we've looked in silo. My child requires care in holidays. My child requires care in school term time. My child is a free school meal child, therefore needs care. My, we earn less than 100k therefore we've got a tax-free childcare. it's confusing who needs care for the, generally the children that need care in the holidays will need care in the term time as well so having a full year service and having that universal model aka like other countries it does seem to make sense um and clearly that should be based on earnings and you know the um so we want that level and up agenda to to be really important we want to make sure that the currently the disparity between low socioeconomic children and young people is leveled up and this could help that you know if, if we've got a child care fund that is related to your earnings then naturally um you can help people get back to work at that level of enrichment there for everyone every child every opportunity is what we're saying um and, it, and if you you know it's a bit geeky but if you add up half funding plus national wraparound child care funding plus tax-free child care funding what's available and you wrap all that up into 984 million, it's a lot of money, then you put that into a different model that actually is based on earnings. You could spend less and have more impact. Um, and it's something that we are championing at the moment and we are asking people to support us. And it's not we're not being confrontational. We want to support and help. We really think that it works in other countries. It's more accessible. It's more affordable. It's simple to understand um, at the moment. I'm not sure it is for parents, you know, oh, they, they parents aren't going to understand what the National Wraparound Child Care Fund is. They're actually not going to, they're not, they're, they can understand that it's trying to create more spaces and access to very big, to Rob's point, it's not being able to be used to subsidise spaces. Um, however, in a sort of way it is, if you're opening the site and having a lower fee and then it's growing, but again, it's how you interpret that. So yeah, we we think that we can reform school aged childcare across the 50, 52 weeks a year and really have it based on family earnings and therefore help level up children. Yeah, no, that's together. definitely going to take everyone coming together. Um, guys, appreciate your time. I know in terms of anyone reaching out after the, um, after listening, um, Hixie, I'm sure we're going to have a lot on the, on the resources area, continuing with guides, um, content like this. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to, to Rob, um, just regarding training, or if they're looking at building up their workforce, or or Craig, I know we've got the white paper and other things that we're going to link into um, into the show notes. So yeah, um, I'm sure there's there's a massive requirement for guidance and, and support around it for, for providers and, and schools. So um, appreciate you sharing, and uh, yeah, we've been enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Have a good Thank night, you. Rob. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. Bye. Thanks, Rob.